everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to discover who you are and why you're here, then do we have the Find Your Soul's Purpose show for you. Today I'll be speaking with Janet Connor, a deep soul explorer, the host of the Unity Online radio show, and the best-selling author of Writing Down Your Soul and her latest, Find Your Soul's Purpose. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about discovering who you are, remembering why you are here, and living a life you love. That plus we'll talk about humpback whales, a visit from a falcon, second grade catechisms, painting with rusty orange, gotcha, who in the world was a quiet fanatic, a dove and two eggs, and what in the world gold-edged holly cards and Sebastian have to do with anything. So, <laughs> welcome to the show, Janet. Are you ready to shine? Well, you've hit all of the like startling, odd, amazing high points. Thank you. Yes, the holy cards and I are ready. <laughs> I, I wanted to get to the essence. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe before we dive into the essence, oh, I forgive the pun. Have you always been into whales? No, no. The whale, as the cover of all of my books, Janet didn't plan any of this. The original cover of my first book that people know me for, you see, it's just blue, yep. writing down your soul. And then when my publisher agreed to do a companion journal, my soul pages, they put this owl mm -hmm. on the cover. And everybody looked at that owl and went, whoa, whoa. And so Writing Down Your Soul came out with a little matching owl. I still didn't get it. I mean, I didn't plan the owl. I thought it was a great cover, but I didn't plan it. Then my next big book came out, The Lotus and the Lily, and my publisher, Canary, stuck a butterfly on it. I looked at that and went, what's a butterfly doing on this book? You know, where's Jesus, where's Buddha, where's the mandala, which is what the book is all about, accessing the original teachings of Buddha and Jesus, who, who knew, said exactly, I mean exactly the same thing about how to create a beautiful life. Is, is that At a yellow that butterfly? Point, yellow, it's a Oregon swallowtail. I, I have a brief story about that afterwards, an okay. experience <laughs> Jessica and I just had yesterday. But first, continue, continue please. So... I, you know, sometimes you know how the breadcrumbs, they come over an extended period of time before you do the V8 commercial and get it. I called my publisher. Mm -hmm. I'm really not happy with that cover and asking what's a butterfly doing on there. And my publisher said, well, Janet, we see an iconic animal on every one of your covers. This was the first time that they had ever conveyed to me that they saw that they would be publishing all the books. This is about the happiest thing that can happen to a writer. It was the middle of the day and there was no way that I could sit here and get any work done. I was in too ecstatic. So here's a little <laughs> about writers. Yeah. When we can't function, we do one of two things. We go take a walk or we take a shower. I took a shower. In the middle of the shower, mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about this. I wasn't asking for it, but I saw the covers of my books. Boom, 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 boom. And because I'm used to this, I, I mean, I'm in the theta brainwave state, I think, most of the time. I have paper in the shower. You can buy this fabulous wow. little pad of paper. It's about this big. It's called Aqua Notes, and it comes with a little pencil, and you stick it to the tiles. And I knew... Uh, I, this is a big deal. I got a hang on to this man. So I wrote the animals on the cover of each book. I didn't understand. I didn't. But there was a swan on soul vows and there was a whale on find your soul's purpose. And I just accept that on faith. I don't know whether whale on is a man, you know. I mean, okay, whale is memory, deep memory. You can look it up in medicine cards. But, but you did have a great story in this one about the spiral and the whale and diving down and the air that's expelled catching all of its, its uh, little, little good eats, so to speak. As soon as I followed the whale, that, and, and the whale is all about memory, 
And this book is 100% about remembering. Mm -hmm. You're remembering. Your soul already knows. You're carrying all this information, all this beauty. We are, each one of us, carrying so much mystical knowledge that if we lived to be 200, we wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface of who we really are. And so the whale is perfect because the whale dives so deeply. It's the perfect metaphor for entering this deep dive from your ninth chakra, which is 18 inches over your head, where you hold your soul's purpose. You and I didn't know that, but there it is. Everybody, it's right there. And then you dive following the spiral all the way down into your heart. And from the round open door at the center of your heart, you dive into the universe. You have access to everything. You are a part, a piece of everything everything. So I'm just obedient. You want a whale on the cover? And and then when I told my publisher, you know, we need a whale. They did this. This is why you want a publisher. And they came up with this beautiful, because it, it, evo it evokes that sense of diving. The tail, the fluke coming up as they're diving deep into the diving waters. Diving deep. So in a perfect world, on the back, there I wanted to have the whale breaching. Okay. So you have dived mm -hmm. into mystical memory and now you're returning There's no, that didn't happen but <laughs> whale diving down so i can tell you the cover of books that are two years down the road what could i say take a shower wow so so the real the real brief synchronicity that i want to hit you add add here is yesterday my wife and I are out um, in a national forest. We're on mountain bikes. And um, just as the sun was coming up over the trees, the butterflies would start lining up on the side of this dirt road. And there are monarch-sized butterflies, and they would start taking off as we pass. A yellow butterfly took off, flew with us, would land at each group of butterflies, I swear, would say hi, would come back and fly with us for at least a mile, if not several miles, until she asked, who sent you here? And then it flew off. And it was the, mo the wildest. It was clearly a sentient being there enjoying us. And it was like, it was so joyous. It was like a tail wag in how it was flying to and fro with us. And when you acknowledge... I'm absolutely confident that everything is conscious, everything is alive, oh, yeah. everything is mirroring. We are a part of all that is. And these animal messengers have been communicating with us, trying to help, walking beside us, flying in front of us, but we don't listen. We don't pay attention. And I was very blessed that my very first teacher in the early 90s, Charlotte Starfire, had studied with Sun Bear and had studied with Ocean of Fast Wolf. And so she had a group, Women's Spiritual Empowerment. Eh, I don't know what that is, but hey. So I showed up in my suit, those 19, early 1990s, you know, little navy blue pinstripe suit with the white bow. Oh, dear God. Sitting on her floor for Women's Spiritual Empowerment. Whatever it is, I'll take it. And she taught us to pray the Native American way. And she taught us about animal messengers. And she took us on a guided meditation. I had never been on a guided meditation. And, 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 but, but, you know, it's, a, it's wonderful when you haven't ever done one because you just don't even know, you know, so your brain isn't moving ahead trying to make anything happen. In the guided meditation, she said, okay, an animal is coming out to greet you. Well, an animal came out to greet me. It was a fox. Well, hello. What's a fox? And that was my waking up to the fact that the animals are talking to us all the time. Last night, I, I'm going to have to, I'll share this with you offline. I'll put it on our Facebook page or something so people can check it out. Last night, I'm doing my upload. It's a daily show, so I got my upload going on. And uh, <laughs> Jessica, my wife, the producer, who just came in a minute ago to check, check on our screen, she comes in and she goes, did you know there's been a deer hanging out with you? And I said, no, that doesn't really surprise me, but no. She goes, look to your left. And I looked, and right outside the window was a buck curled up on the ground watching me, just watching me. And so I, I took photos, of course, and, and, then, and then he wandered off to be with his doe, and I went outside and, and sat 
with him, about 20 feet off, sat with him for about 10 minutes. The doe was just wandering around, and they have two twins, and they've actually nursed outside my other studio window right in front of me, like mama's looking at me, and, and he's just watching me the whole time. And I just sat, and I'm like, what are you trying to share with me? What's the message? And I went to sleep last night, and I'm not sure I got the message, but I just kept asking, and I will continue to ask, what are they trying to share? And I, I think the animals, like you're saying, they always, they have messages for each of us if we All go into time. that space. Well, if we're going to talk animals, anybody who has read Writing Down Your Soul knows my relationship with ospreys. So you will love this story. Osprey is my guardian, my teacher. Mm -hmm. So November 1st, 1996, I had had this traumatic experience with my husband the night before. That morning, I woke up. Now, I, I had, you know, my spiritual life was maybe about that thing. This, this is you had, had kind of your first spiritual experience July of 96, so only a few months earlier. Only, right. I mean, this was all happening, but I didn't know it. You don't know that the universe is giving birth to your divine purpose. You, you don't know that. And that is why I wrote the book, so people actually could be conscious of it. So I, I'm waking up, and it's as if these words are alive. I can feel, feel five words coming through my body, and the five words are, I am afraid of you. And that was the moment I realized, oh, my God, i got to get a divorce. I mean, I can't have somebody sleeping in this bed that I'm afraid of. I am afraid of you. That day, I stepped outside. I mean, just probably an hour after having this awareness, mm -hmm. and there was an osprey on the tree over this little tiny 10 foot by 10 foot dock in the backyard here in Florida. And I love ospreys, so I spoke to the osprey, I thanked it for being there, but I had no idea that for the next 18 months, that osprey would never leave that branch. That osprey stayed in my backyard, screamed at me during the day, and I'd run outside to say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I would go out at night and say my prayers through the osprey. Now, ospreys don't do this. Same place, 18 months. At the end of 18 months, I no longer could make the house payment, and I had to sell the house. So I'm really feeling badly, not really for me. I'm with my osprey, I got to go, I got to go tell the osprey, I'm sorry. So I came out to the edge of the dock, like I always do to say my prayers at night, and with tears streaming down my face, I thank the osprey. I say, you've done a fabulous job. 18 months, not a hair of our heads have been hurt. And this was, Michael, an, you know, a violent divorce. Not a hair of our heads have been hurt. Thank you so much, but I'm really sorry. I've got to sell the house now. You can go. The second I said you can go, five and a half foot wingspan. And because he was only 10 feet in front of me, and he didn't return. Now, he has returned in multiple forms. Everywhere I am, there are ospreys. Everywhere I am, everywhere I've lived, there are ospreys. But if that isn't proof, so the osprey is a fish hawk. And I asked the osprey, this is the question you were trying to say, why, who, what is the deer, why are you here? Mm -hmm. What is the butterfly, why are you here? So I teach this. I say, ask the animal, tell me why you're here. Tell me why you're here. Tell me why you're here. And because I do everything in deep soul writing, mm -hmm. I can either ask the question in soul writing or ask it and then pick up a pen. So scroll ahead from 1996 to when I bought this house in uh, 99. Yeah. I'm driving my son to grade school, fifth grade, and I see an osprey on the ground right around the corner from my house. Ospreys are not on the ground. But I, of course, we're running late. And I said to the osprey, stay right there. I'll be right back. <laughs> Drop Jerry off, turn around and come back. There is an osprey on the ground. Rigor mortis has not even set in. I could lift the wings. There was one drop of blood right here. One drop of blood. That's it. Not a feather was crushed. This was not an animal that was hit by a car. I couldn't leave it there mm -hmm. for raccoons. And I took I get it, it home. I took it home. So <laughs> then I, 
now what am I doing with that Osprey? So I called my friend Charlotte, who introduced me to the Native American way and teaching and praying outside to the seven directions. And I said, Charlotte, what does it mean when an Osprey kind of sort of almost dies in your arms? And she said, well, I think I know, but it's not for me to tell you. Ask the bird. Mm -hmm. I was mad. I was at the time. How stupid can you be? I was being handed this magnificent guidance. And instead, I was thinking, you've got owl parts in your freezer. You wear bear claws. Why can't you tell me what the osprey means? Come on. Best advice I'd ever been given. So I held the osprey like a baby. And I put my hand on its heart and then my heart. And I went back and forth for yeah, maybe eight or ten minutes. Tell me why you're here. Tell me why you're here. Tell me why you're here. And at some point, I, I can't say exactly why or when, I just was ready. And I picked up a pen. Mm -hmm. And this is verbatim what came out. What is an osprey? A fish hawk. What is a hawk? A messenger. What is a fish? The symbol of Christ. What did Jesus say more than anything else? Fear not. And I knew that that was the message for me. Now, that's not a universal. Every osprey, osprey flying in front of you isn't necessarily saying fear not. But that was the message I needed. So I encourage people because they'll say to me upon hearing this story, there was a hawk in my backyard. There's three white feathers on my path. There's this. There's that. Cardinals are. And I say, ask the animal. Tell me why you're here. Tell me why you're here. Tell me why you're here. And without exception, people receive in some way an answer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I apologize that I haven't read your soul writing book as we're actually writing a book on automatic writing ourselves right now. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we can have another conversation about deep soul writing. I think we're going to have to do that. <laughs> and and last night, and and I regularly go in, go into automatic writing several times a day, if not more. But last night I said, I'm going to go to bed early. And so I was asking for that guidance from the deer, but I hadn't put pen to paper yet, as you are so astutely recommending. So, and or the animal can um, visit you at night. That's what in I was dreams, asking for. In dreams, yeah, absolutely. And then I write down my dreams in the morning. And so that's what I was, was going for. <laughs> And I'm confident the deer was communicating with you in some way. <laughs> Sometimes it's obvious, you know, the animal is itself. I've had some rather amazing bear dreams. There have been no bears in my backyard. That's fine. That, this, this is good. But the bear will come and communicate in my dreams. <laughs> so deer is clearly with you, not once. Not just, an, you know... The, this is a family of deers. And without getting out my medicine cards, I know deer represents gentleness, gentleness, gentleness. And that works. My expression that, that I've taught everybody on this show is kind, gentle, easy, good. That's well, like my motto. <laughs> Well, I have a feeling that deer, because um, if you look at the medicine cards, the Native American cards by Jamie Sams, it's been out, gosh, 20, 30 years. Um, deer. Now, now e e even when you read, I do encourage people, yes, it's lovely to open uh, Ted Andrews, mm -hmm. Animal Speak. It's lovely to open medicine cards. But in the end, in the end, that deer has come to you. That buck has come to you. That osprey has come to you. That whale has come in your dream. So ask the animal. But still, it is kind of nice to know that deer in general, by the Native American tradition, is a, a gift of gentleness. Woohoo! <laughs> so <laughs> let's go from there. I want to dive into your book. Maybe before we do that, my eyes roll back as I say dive as I'm thinking of the whale now. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Sophia and how did she come into your life? 
Well, now, there is an entire show. <laughs> Sophia is the face of the divine for me. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up Catholic, and so, like it or not, you are going to perceive, I perceive that God was a guy, and God was, you know, not a very happy guy, and that God guy was over there judging, and, you know, this was, now, mind you, I'm uh, considerably older than you. I grew up in a traditional Orthodox Catholic family in the city of Chicago in the 1950s, where your entire um, self-perception, like like you weren't a person, you were a member of a particular parish when you met kids. It was like, mm -hmm. well, what parish are you in? You know. So I didn't even know that I was carrying this um, perception of God as a masculine and a little judgmental. Now, mind you, I stepped away. Once the Vietnam War came and I was in college, I was much more interested in protesting the Vietnam War than I was in going to mass. So that was kind of the end of that tradition for me. But it left this, only I didn't know it, this big vacuum. And I was hungry for something, but I didn't even know what I was hungry for. I guess that's why when a friend said, Charlotte's got this women's spirit, yeah, sure, I'll go play. And when I discovered Deep Soul Writing, thanks to this startling divorce, I did address the divine as dear God, comma. Mm -hmm. It's what I knew, and I had for 20 years absolutely no negative perception that, I mean, miracles opened my my writing career, everything I teach, nothing but beauty came my way. So I didn't even know that anything was missing. And then I was getting ready in November of 2014 to lead the live course for the Lotus and the Lily. Yeah. And at the beginning of it, you write a prayer. You write your own prayer for the 30-day Lotus and Lily experience. And the women in the class said, well, are you going to write a new prayer? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. I like the prayer that's in the book. Well, the next morning, out of my hand comes a new prayer. I ask to be a strong container. And I thought mm -hmm. that I was writing a prayer for 30 days. I had no intellectual awareness that what I was saying is I am an open. I asked to be a vessel for the divine. I just, pew, it's amazing how, you know, that these, this depth is in front of you all the time. It's in you. It's talking to you. And you can be pretty, just walk into your life, pretty oblivious. And even with all of the deep work I'd done, I really thought that this prayer, blessed one, we are one. I am a strong container for the life that wants to be lived in and through and as me in 2015, that was then, mm -hmm. and beyond. That life is your life, our life. And so I ask to be a strong container. And I can and I will and I am because we are the strong container for the whole and holy thrilling life flowing in and through and as us. Bless our holy container. Now, I still say that every single night before dinner. But at the time, I thought I was just going to say it for 30 days, and it was going to open me to this beautiful intention mandala for 2015. Mm -hmm. Well, on December 1st, I got sick. I don't get sick, Michael. I do not get sick. I don't get so much as a cold. I don't get sick. So this really got my attention. And this wasn't, I don't feel good. This was in bed for six days, unable to do anything but purge. And I purge, and I purge, and I purge, and I'm, I'm kind of ashamed. And it was, in the end, it didn't end for 40 days. That didn't, I got that, 40 days and 40 nights, right? So this was this initiation. Even in the middle of it, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And but I because I couldn't function, I couldn't write. I was uh, I, once I could get out of bed, I sat in my downstairs reading chair and I always have 20 or 30 books next to me because just like you, I read every single book for everybody that's going to be on my radio show. Plus, I have all of my mystical research. And so uh, you know, I probably read um, 110 or so spiritual nonfiction books a year. So uh, I had a pile 
a, mm-hmm. a books of the people that were going to be on my show in January and February of 2015. And I had my journal. At the moment, I'm kind of a big fan of these plain, plain black. But as I showed you, and I have, I can't even tell you how many of these I've filled the companion journal to writing down your soul. So interesting that all the books on my little stash there, the only thing I could read, they were all about the divine feminine. Hmm. Hmm. I still didn't get it. But I read Margaret Starbird's books. I read Cynthia Bourgeau's The Meaning of Mary Magdalene. I read this magnificent, hard-to-read research study done by a German woman tracking the divine feminine, starting with Mott or Matt in Egypt through Sophia in Greece and and all the way she shows up. And Uh, One of the things that really made me go, whoa, is the famous story of Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River and a dove. You remember reading a dove lands on his left shoulder. Left is the divine feminine. Now, I read that story as a kid. Nobody ever said, nobody ever said a word about what the dove meant. The dove is Sophia. The dove is the divine feminine. The dove is Chokhmah, to use the Hebrew And every single person hanging out in the first century around the Jordan River knew bloody well that that was the kiss of the divine feminine. That was the recognition of who he really was. Sister Mary Margaret never told me that. (laughs) So suddenly, as all these breadcrumbs, I now see them as breadcrumb after breadcrumb Mm -hmm. after breadcrumb, she arrived. She just arrived. And she showed up by... Um, when I went to pick up a pen, here is how I have to. I mean, I just have to. I don't know if you can see this on the camera. In my daily writing, it says, Beloved Vibration of Sophia! Exclamation yep. point. And I better put that exclamation point on. And it just happened. Beloved Vibration of Sophia! Exclamation point. And the second it happened, I could feel. I could feel. Feel this shift because God was no longer a man. God was no longer masculine. God no longer had that anger, testosterone energy. God was feminine. And a feminine God fits in this body. And a masculine God doesn't. Just doesn't. And so my life since Sophia showed up, I thought I had a pretty delicious writing and teaching life prior. It took off. I, I just joke now that I'm, I, I'm, I'm moving as fast as I can here. I'm writing at eternal speed. Mm-hmm. And she moves pretty fast. We got books to write and things to teach and tough stuff to do just this morning. This morning, I got a download on everything I'm going to do on my radio show, The Soul Directed Life, all next year. Done. Complete. There it is. Okay. 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 And in, in, um, Thomas Merton has this adorable uh, poem about when you really have an intense relationship with the divine, it, it, he calls it, it's, it's like getting on the express. You know, now you're on the express train. <laughs> and, and when I read that, I went, that's it. That's it. I know this. I know what this feels like. So, yeah, my, the divine for me. Now, that doesn't mean people reading my books have to perceive the divine as feminine. Now, it, it's true that an awful lot of the people that gravitate to me, they're in love with this concept. And um, I, I, I actually should do a survey. How many of them actually address the divine or perceive the divine in a feminine way? I'm teaching tomorrow night. I'll find out. So um, th- th- this is a huge um, transformation for me. I mm-hmm. am a strong container. For the divine. And every single one of us is. This is not unique to Janet. Michael is a strong container. However you perceive, the divine could be an animal. The divine could be a Hindu god or goddess. The divine could be a color. Right? It's not that it's, you don't, you can't put the divine in a box. The divine is the mystery. The best um, teaching I know, and it is really the central it's like the vortex of the spiral of this Mm -hmm. book is a hadith. The sayings of Muhammad, which was dictated by Gabriel, Mm -hmm. Archangel Gabriel, but it's not in the Quran. 
and that's why it's called a hadith, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've been chewing over this sentence for a long, long time. I'll probably chew over it for the rest of my life. Here's the hadith as I understand it, and I don't speak Arabic, so this is going to be an Anglo translation. God is speaking, and God says, I was a hidden treasure. Now, try to visualize before the Big Bang, you know, this the, the divine that we can't mm -hmm. conceptualize. We just can't. So the divine says, I was a hidden treasure, and I loved to be known. And so I created the world that I might be known. Beautiful. It's that simple. And that it's so mystical that you can't figure it out. Right. So you are an expression of the divine, giving the divine the opportunity to be known, to be perceived, to be smelled, to be felt, to be loved, to be tasted. That's Michael. That's Janet. That's Jessica. That's every single person watching us. We are all embodying the divine, however you feel it or perceive it, so that the divine can be present in the world. Well, look at our world. You think maybe we need a little more divine presence? This is why we're here. This is why we're here right now. <laughs> As every single one of us lives our soul's purpose, expresses our gentleness, expresses our strength, blesses the world as we fulfill our soul's purpose. That's, yes, Michael, but it's also the divine in and through and as Michael. Blessing the world thank you thank you thank you let's go from there and let's dive into we can look at our soul purpose we can look at the soul purpose of all of us you say our soul's divine purpose is not a goal and it's not one thing what do you mean by that this is, a, I think, an essential idea. I don't even like the word purpose. I wish I could invent a new word because the word purpose has been sort of grabbed by corporations mm -hmm. and grabbed by psychology, you know, life purpose, goals, accomplishments. Your soul's purpose is this reflection of the divine. If, if you could, um, if you like this analogy, if all divine purpose is just some sort of enormous, incomprehensible diamond, mm -hmm. then one tiny facet of it belongs to Michael. And no one can reflect that in that way, that divine expression. And no one can do Janet's and no one can do Carla's and no one can do his Marsh's. We are all here to reflect this divinity, this divine presence. So that can't be a goal that you can measure. Mm -hmm. It's not a job. Now, if you have and you know your soul's purpose, it will always express itself in the work that you do. But it's not a job. Nobody's sole purpose is to be a plumber, to be a, you know, what, whatever that job is, to own this business and be a great success at that. That could be a corporate goal. It could be a lot of nice things, but it's not a sole purpose. Now, I still, I did have it in my head mm -hmm. that your sole purpose was one direction or one sentence. I'll actually show you mine. Look at this note card I made on July 9th, 1996. I had no idea. I mean, none, 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 none. I thought I was a very successful human resource consultant. I had created the hiring program at CNN mm -hmm. and I had been a headhunter for 11 years and I I went out on my own and wanted to teach corporations how to hire. So Janet, if you asked her, was a human resource consultant specializing in recruitment systems. What can I say? Well, let, let me. Uh, do you want to read that to people who can't actually yeah. see that? So well, one day, my fellow human resource consultants and I are supposed to be working on a recruitment program for a big insurance company. I needed a team to help me with it. And one of us walks in and says, push those files aside. We're going to do this. And she holds up a book, but it's a corporate mission statement book. And I'll play. Sure. So we put aside everything. We get out notepads and pieces of paper. 
and she starts shooting questions at us. And you answer the question, and you answer the question, and you know, kind of brainstorm. Okay, and you answer the question. And when she's finished asking, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 questions, she says, now, she's reading the instructions out of this book. She says, now, pick the words you like. Oh, words. Okay. Light. Oh, yeah, I like that word. Okay. Connect. Oh, I love that word. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then you turn, turn them into a sentence. So here I am, a human resource consultant, so I think, and I write on this 8 by 5 blue note card, use words to connect people to the light. I looked at that and went, well, this isn't going to help me make six figures as a human resource consultant. And I said, okay, that was fun. Now, let's get out the notebooks and get back to work for the insurance company. But then the divorce happened. I lost the house, furniture, my son and I, everything we owned was down to 40 cardboard boxes. It's all we had in the world. And I had no memory that this card was in those 40 boxes, none. Mm -hmm. So, scroll ahead to doing the research to write, writing down your soul. And I stumbled upon Laura Lynn Bunn, the great Akashic Record teacher and trainer. And she is helping me understand the mystical aspects of deep soul writing. And finally, she said, you know, Janet, you can't write about this if you don't have an Akashic Record consultation. So let me give you one. Oh, okay. That sounds like fun. I'll play. So, we get on the phone. And suddenly, in the midst of, I mean, I've never had one of these before, so I don't know what's going to happen. But she's going, oh, oh, oh. I'm thinking, is this normal? Is this what happens? And my ex-husband, who had died, pushed his way through and apologized. Cool. Apologized. How many people on the planet absolutely know that they received an apology from the other side and confirmation that he is with me and with me always? So... After I stopped crying and sort of collected, collected myself about that, I said, okay, so, and Laurelyn was a little, oh, too, and finally she said, so, your first question, and my first question was, am I fulfilling my soul's purpose? Seems like a sensible question to ask, right? And the masters and teachers said, well, this is not the life you came in for. At this point, I went, oh, no. Oh no, what am I going to do? But of course I'm too, first of all, I've been through this whoa experience and I don't think you're supposed to interrupt and, you know, so I'm just sitting there kind of frozen. And they said, but when you checked the box Mm -hmm. to be a writer, all these hidden talents came forward and now writing will usher you out of this body. And then they said, and because you checked the box to be a writer in this lifetime, When you return, you will be a writer, not spiritual, not memoir, pure art form. So, Michael, come back, because I'm going to write the great American novel in the next lifetime. But, I mean, I didn't understand any of this. I, none of this. I was just, this was the most flabbergasting afternoon of my life. But I called my friend, and I told her about this. And I said, check the box, check the box. When did I check any box? I didn't check any box. I don't know anything about checking any box. And she said, don't you remember that day when we did that exercise? And I went, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I hung up on her and immediately went into my office shelves behind me. Mm -hmm. And I poked and I poked and I poked because there's a lot of papers in there, a lot of journals. And what are the chances? My hand fell almost immediately on this card. I had kept it, or rather, my soul had kept it. Janet, consciously, didn't even know what it meant. I had kept this card. And look, do I use words to connect people to the light within their divinity? Uh, Yes, that's what I do every minute of every day. Wow. <laughs> I still feel, Michael, that's, it's my story, and I still look at this every day because I chant this as mm-hmm. a prayer every day. And w- without exception, I get teary because what I discovered when I really delved into teaching this and writing the book is this isn't I, Janet. 
use words to connect people to the light. Think of the hidden treasure. When I chant it, I chant it first as me, and then I say, I, Sophia, use words to connect people to the light. Now, how is Sophia going to do that? In Janet, through Janet, and as Janet. And then the third way is I, the one who uses words, is the one words uses. So it's this union. This Mm -hmm. is the sacred marriage. Yes, I will do this. This is the love of my life. I use words, and it is Sophia really using the words. Because doesn't that happen to you? You read something. I'm rereading my book right now because I'm teaching it, and I find myself underlining it. It's like, wow, look at this. i got to remember this. And it's like, who wrote this? Man, this is good. (laughs) Any writer will tell you this. You know, if you think that you're the one, the only one writing the book, you're not writing a very exciting book. But when you surrender, call it the great writer in the sky. When you surrender and allow the book that wants to be written by the divine in and through and as you to emerge, these are the books that people love. These are the books that change people's lives. But the first life they change? Aren't you discovering that as you're writing your book on writing? Oh, this one's been, this one's been a mind bender. This one's actually, it's, oh, because when I started writing it, first off, I had no plans to write this. This was not the book that I wanted to write. This, this was the book That's that a clue. Jessica and I went back and forth walking in the forest going, I'm not writing a book on automatic writing. And she's like, you said you were. You were told to write this. <laughs> And so I started it. And then right now our book's gone to the editor. And, and so I'm doing some reading, a, a reading of different sections as they, as they go to the editor and we go back and forth. And, and I have no idea of, of a lot of what I wrote. And particularly because in the beginning, it started with, I don't know if it's fully head writing it, but there was a plan, a purpose, a direction, an outline. And about halfway through it all vaporized. And, and, and that's when it, it went from, you're going to get in touch with your higher self, you're going to get in touch with your intuition, to all of a sudden, dear Michael, dear ones, what? <laughs> that's deep soul writing, that's it, that's absolutely it. You are in communion, you are in connection, and that divine wisdom that lives inside of you is communicating. Yeah, follow, yeah. that's it. And that's, that's, that's the mind bender for the, not so much a heady writer. I'm operating, I hope, mainly on heart these days. But still, as you're trying to figure out what you do with this book, which has three or four, or how many voices, what do you do? And, and you, you call upon your editor and go, I might need a little help here. <laughs> <laughs> so um. let's, let's dive from there and, and let's talk about soul purpose for a little bit here. Um, one of the things, if we go back a step that you were that you were saying is um, in the guidance that you were given to use your words in your current book, you can't fail at this. What do you mean by that? Because people are going to wonder, first off, how do I discover my soul purpose? And am I screwing things up? Yeah. Well, everybody thinks. I mean, look at me when they said, well, this isn't the path you chose. I go, ah! I've screwed up. I mean, it's an automatic. And it does seem to be the, I think we're more sensitive to this right now because the world is in so much pain. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, everywhere you look, people are grasping and hunger for where is the logic in here? Where is the meaning in here? Look what's being done to Mother Earth. Look at how governments, I mean, we're very hypersensitive to this in the United States, but governments around the world are just disintegrating and dissolving and people are feeling, wow. Well, when I got the go ahead from my publisher to write this book, it came a full year and and probably two years sooner than I expected. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of threw me for a loop. It's like soul vows isn't even out and you want me to write the next book? Well, okay hey, this is a good thing. This is what a writer wants. But at the same time, part of my stomach went, there's something I'm missing here. I don't get this. I'm not just, I I need answers. So I um, had a conversation with the angels through Margot Mastromarchy Mm -hmm. and Laura Lynn Bunn and Margot. They're all in the um, 
resource section of the book. So that was my first question to the angels. I go, what's with the timing? And they said the most astonishing thing. Now, keep in mind, they said this in March of 2015. And they said, your world is in crisis right now. Now, go back and look. I mean, there was a lot of crud happening. I'm not saying we were Pollyanna, everything was hunky-dory. But would we have said in March of 2015 that the world was in crisis right now? I wouldn't have. But when this book came out... April of 2017, would I say that our world was in crisis? Yes, I would. I absolutely would. Our world, our whole world is in crisis. So then they said, every single one of us that lives our soul's purpose is helping shift the alignment Mm -hmm. of the world. Now, I knew going into this that your soul's purpose is a divine purpose, but I on my own, would never have gotten this piece. I guess logically I should have been able to connect the dots, but I I would have missed this, that as Michael is fully Michael, Mm -hmm. expressing the divine in and through and as Michael, that heals the world. That changes because it's changing. Like everybody listening to you, we're having an impact on their vibration and then they're having an impact on the vibration of the people around them. So every single one of us, as we become the being that we are here to be, we are literally changing the vibration of the planet. Well, okay. (laughs) It's big, but but I don't want that to sound like responsible and scary mm-hmm. because it is true that you you already are. Every we we have a tendency, and I actually had kind of a argument with my um publisher about that verb, find your soul's purpose, because that makes it sound like it's hidden somewhere, it's hiding behind a tree, it's under a rock. I wanted to use the verb remember. And the entire book is about remembering. Remember. Mem- Burr, yeah, which really means the medical re, you are realigning, reshifting your members, your parts, your bodies. This is something Michael knows something about, all <laughs> of the parts. You are remembering yourself back to your original form. Well, what's your original form before you had a face, before you had cells? It's a soul. So we are returning to our full vibration of light. All we are is light. All we are is vibration. All we are is a soul. So you came as a soul and you're going to leave as a soul. So you're not screwing this up. What reading a book like this, following the spiral, following deeply into any spiritual or mystical practice, what that does is drop you deeper into the heart, deeper, deeper. So you can know and live your soul's purpose more consciously, more joyously, but you're not now not living it. It's not like there's this railroad track over here and you have totally screwed up by not getting on that train and now you're way the hell over here and you're going to the wrong place. No, you're on your path. But what happens when you enter the spiral which is the accelerator of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Your consciousness literally expands as you walk this sacred spiral. You drop into this awareness of who you really are. And now you can't miss all the ways in which you are God's hands and feet and presence on earth. Maybe this will be helpful to the listeners because my soul's purpose in a lot of ways is a misnomer because it kind of, sort of, sounds like it could be a job. Mm -hmm. I use words. I mean, that sounds like somebody that writes. That sounds like somebody with a radio show. That sounds like somebody that leads retreats. That sounds like somebody that teaches. And you can tell I got a few words and I love using words to connect people to the light. But 90% of people who come 
to my live courses, who send me emails, who tell me about what they discovered as they walked the sacred spiral is not anything that in any way you could label a career or a job or a goal. For example, the woman cutting my hair came to the course last year. And I never asked her, you know, to tell me how's it going. I, I, but one day, recently, is she's cutting my hair. She said, you know, I walked the sacred spiral last year. And I did remember my soul's purpose. I don't understand it, but I remember it. And I said, well, if you'd like to share, I'd love to hear. And she said, yes, my soul's purpose is two words become visible. Hmm, I love it. My goo, I mean, the, the hair, the, you can, I don't know if you can see, still. And I went, Anita, given what we know about the hadith, the hidden treasure, that we are not seeking the divine, the divine is seeking the divine in, through, and as us, that is about the most profound soul purpose I've ever heard in my entire life. Because as Anita becomes visible, who's becoming visible? Right? I was like, wow, that's a soul purpose. And then uh, last week, a woman in my live class in Italy, she shared it with us hours after she got it. Hours after she got it. And she, and she was just kind of, huh. she said, well, I, and and, you, and you, you, you know when it's yours. You know it. You know, your heart, you burst into tears and your heart opens. It's non-negotiable, no matter what somebody else thinks. You, you know, and you know that you know. And she said, my soul's purpose is to bless others. Wow, beautiful. That's it. So is she blessing others in her work for an Italian corporation? Yes. Is she blessing others in her relationships? Yes. Is she blessing others by walking in the grocery store, by picking up litter on the sidewalk? Everything. is. She's a blessing. She's a walking blessing. So who's the blessing, Right. So so let's let's go briefly from there, and then and then we'll jump into some some wrap up questions and and a, and a short <laughs> meditation. Where do we begin? How do we begin to remember to put back together the purpose that we came here with? And if I even had the time today, I would dive into that we came here with in the womb, in before the womb, and each step along the way. That's why I wrote the book, because that can seem like an overwhelming question. Well, how do I begin? Because it could be pretty thrilling to hear somebody say, to become visible, to use words to connect people to the light, to express beauty. They Right? Those all sound lovely, but how did those people get them? Now, I'm, there are other ways. There, there have to be other ways. But I discovered... First in deep soul writing, uh, the stories of how the spiral made itself known is in the book. I discovered that if you allow the spiral, which is the sacred geometry shape of life, all mm -hmm. of life is in this shape. This is a, I cut it out from the website, this is a Fibonacci spiral, and the Fibonacci sequence is the golden mean. This is perfection. This is the reason we love Renaissance art. So this isn't just some cute little, oh, that's a nice little shape. This actually is the geometric form of every artichoke, every pine cone, every tree, every flower, every rose. You can kind of see how it expands along the living life force. So mm -hmm. what all my book does is give you a way to do this slowly. In the first loop, all you do is play with this accelerator of consciousness. In the second loop, you look in your own eyes and listen to your own stories. In the third loop, you go back and remember birth, and you can remember birth. And today, that's not some wacky, woo-woo spiritual concept. Perinatal and prenatal science is clearly showing that the baby is fully present in the womb, conscious, aware, senses are developing, and remembers birth. And I tell the mind-boggling story of my son telling me that he remembered exactly how he was born. And then you reach this fourth loop, and you finally step out of time. 
And when you step out of time, you're back in your first form, pure light, pure spirit, pure soul. And you have a mystical encounter. And so if I just said, well, go have a mystical encounter, that could be like, well, okay, how do I do that? The question you asked. But if I can hand you this gentle Mm -hmm. step by step, my stories, other people that have walked the spiral, their stories, and every one of the chapters, every one of the loops is like a smorgasbord. It's like a mystical playground. Here, you could do this, and you could do this, and you could do the soul sketching, and you could do dreaming, and you could do this, and you pick and choose. Oh, this speaks to me. Or more likely, as you begin to trust your own intuition and your own guidance, you will find your own ways of walking the first spiral and walking the second and walking the third. But to make certain that a person has the experience, at the end of each chapter, I lead them in a guided meditation. And once you sort of slip into how easy this is and just follow the words, follow the silence, then these little Little pieces, the members you are, and then you remember yourself back into this knowing. You just know, and you know that you know, this is mine. This is mine. This is why I'm here. Thank you. So from there, a few quick wrap-up questions, and we'll jump into a meditation. First off, I want to throw my coaching hat back on. I always like to give people homework so that they're not just listening to this and being entertained, but they have something they have to go and do. What one homework assignment would you give people today to help them begin to discover or remember their soul purpose? Well, I'd begin with some big questions. Everything starts with an inquiry. And that's why every single chapter is just packed full of inquiries. I love questions. Questions are the magic that activates that consciousness beyond your limited left brain logical consciousness. And so I would allow myself to say, well, what are the big questions in my life right now? What is it I want to know? Now, I immediately would be picking up a pen and writing them down. But you could do it with your eyes closed. You could do it in reflection. You could do it while you're walking. Take a nice long walk alone, no no electronics, and ask yourself, what is it I want to know right now? Mm -hmm. What is it that's missing in my life right now? Why did listening to Michael and Janet have... What is this itch? What itch was created in listening to this conversation? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I really? And why am I here? Why am I here? Now, these are two of the five sacred questions. These are big, big, big questions. So please don't feel that you get your answer, boom, boom. This isn't how bunch is two plus two. But to sit with Who am I? For days, weeks, months, this is the great Hindu and Buddhist question, who am I? How shall I live? How shall I live? Why am I here? It's not the job. Whatever that job is you have, that job may pay the bills and that job may be of great service. It may be a wonderful job. It may be a beautiful company that you have created. But Why am I here? Why did I come at this time? How can I serve? How can I help shift the pain in this world right now? You see, I mean, I could, we could, I could come up with questions for 30 minutes. So begin by simply opening to ask yourself, what questions am I asking myself right now? And then follow Rainer Maria Wilke. I can't say his name. Rainer Maria Wilke's advice: Don't go seeking an answer. Live the questions. Live the questions. So allow yourself as you're walking and you're asking, "Who am I?" To be comfortable with the fact that shit, I don't know. Who am I? <laughs> Stay in that place. Stay in that place. And of course, if you would like to begin your deep soul writing then carry those questions onto the page and your guidance will come. It will come. And if an animal arrives while you're asking those questions, ask the animal, 
tell me what you have to teach me. Tell me why you're here. Woohoo! <laughs> What advice? My, my wife, Jessica, she's a producer. She always likes me to ask a que question for parents, for their kids. Mm. What advice would you give parents today? And I would say to help kids to remember, but maybe the kids already do. Well, they do. That's it. it. All we're doing, Michael, is trying to go back to our three-year-old self. Your three-year-old self completely knows who you are, what your talents are, what your gifts. That's why on the second loop, you get out these photographs of yourself, mm -hmm. and which my mother love, lovingly saved, and you look yourself in your own eyes. If you spend an afternoon, even looking at your high school picture, <laughs> oh, God. <Wow. laughs> but look, now you're not looking at the hair and, you know, all that. You are looking in your own eyes mm -hmm. because we say that your eyes are the window to the soul they are and i give you the science in the book that explains how they are that two-year-old three-year-old five-year-old seven-year-old self absolutely knows who she is knows why she's here knows her gifts and talents but very quickly in our educational system, our parents want us to be a success, and all those natural artistic capabilities <laughs> get squashed. So my advice to parents, um, do a little reading about uh, Bruce Lipton, and he'll explain how a child from about a little bit before two through seven or eight is primarily in the theta brainwave state. Your book and all of my books are helping adults drop into Bingo. the theta brainwave state. We should just spend time with the children. They are in the theta brainwave state. If you will allow them, don't go showing them flashcards and trying to turn them into corporate little automatons. Tell stories, dance with them, um, have conversations with their invisible friends. Ask them the big questions. Go ahead. Ask a five-year-old. Tell me why you're here. Who are you? They'll tell you. When my son was seven and the divorce was getting really scary, he asked me one day, and I can't remember if this story's in the book or not. Yeah, it is. He asked, it is. And he said, he's looking me right in the eye, right in the eye, because we're, we're wrestling on the bed, you know. And he says, why did you marry dad? Now, to be honest, Michael, what I wanted to say is, I have no blank and idea. I must have been out of my blank and mind. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. But I couldn't say this. This child loves his father, right? So I'm looking right in his, in his eyes and I said, sweetheart, I'm glad I did because here you are. I have you. And the kid sighed, you know, like, oh, oh, you adults, you were just so stupid. And looking me right in the eye, he said, don't you know I would have come, I would just look different. <laughs> they already know. So if we would strip our adult perception of what a child should be learning and what a child should be playing and how they should be playing and they should be learning to accomplish something, just be with them mm -hmm. and tell them their birth story and let them tell you their birth story. Woohoo! They're the ones who know. <laughs> we, the adults, are like, you know, trying to go back to remember. Mm -hmm. They get it. So from there, a question we like to ask all our guests just to, just shortly before the end is what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> it's creativity. It's absolutely creativity. I spend my mornings... Um, I say my nine containers of love, the invocation to Sophia. I do my deep soul writing and deep soul reading. Like this morning, I told you, complete download on the entire schedule for 2018 on the Soul Directed Life. How happy can you be, right? So in that state of communion, because creativity isn't Janet's coming up with an idea. Creativity is putting these hands and this mind and these eyes and this knowing and all of these life experiences in service to the divine expressing in and through and as me. But when I get out of the way and something delicious and creative and uh, books, 
I got a few books, uh, comes flying through me. That makes me very, very happy. Yay, 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 yay. <laughs> makes you happy too, doesn't it? Absolutely. Although in the midst of it, that creative angst of the what the. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, the, 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 getting that voice, that judgmental voice, out of the way and that's it's a constant struggle mm -hmm. that you're in that creative flow and then your logic brain goes that's never gonna sell what are you doing you can't do that blah, 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 blah. and then you just have to say your prayers and get back in that state absolutely back in that state of service trusting when um one of my books soul vows was going to be late um i and i felt so guilty because you're not supposed to turn in books late but i finally worked up my courage to uh tell my editor I'm really sorry, but it's going to be late. And I was sort of waiting to be scolded. Instead, I got an email that said, take all the time you need. Write the book that wants to be written. Perfect. Perfect. And I will take those words. Thank you. That, that was Thank for you. you. I Thank wasn't you. planning on saying that, but <laughs> that's for you today. Yes, Thank you, write universe. the book that wants to be written. It's right there in your energy field. It's floating. If mm. I could see or as I could see it it's right there and it's trying to drop down through your heart and your hands and your left brain is going wow oh, it's me 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 and you just have to say that's enough dear it's <laughs> write the book that wants to be read Thank and then you. you can't help but just kind of go woo woo all the time <laughs> All right. On that note, where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book, Find Your Soul Purpose? Well, you know that euphemism. Uh, what, how do they say it? Everywhere fine books are sold. So uh, because it is available internationally, if you pop over to my website, Janet Connor, C-O-N-N-E-R.com, mm -hmm. there's a page for the book. And by no means is it every international order button, but Italy, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, of course, IndieBound and uh, Barnes and Noble and Amazon in the United States as well as internationally. And if somebody can't find it, send me an email, Janet at JanetConnor.com, and my assistant and I will, it, it's available everywhere. I've heard the craziest stories. I heard a story about somebody in Thailand walking through a bookstore and the book fell off and landed on their feet. I love I said, it when no, that happens. I don't, know, I don't know how it got to Thailand, but hey. <laughs> And, of course, if you want a signed copy, I have a, a few in my kitchen, and I'll be happy to sign one for you. Very, very cool. So last thing I've got before a short meditation is any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? All right. Let's go inside and ask, because this has been such a rich, rich conversation. And I think the wisdom is the words that want to be spoken right now is you already know. You already know. You already know. You may not have words for it. You may not even have a feeling for it. But you are a soul. And your soul already knows how precious, how beautiful, how holy, and how sacred you are. And the divine seed that you are carrying in your heart. And that's a mighty woohoo! <laughs> You, you're good at that. You're really like that. <laughs> <laughs> so then do you have a brief meditation you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, when you asked me about that, I the meditations for the each loop of the book are the better part of an hour long. So I'm just taking a small piece out of the meditation for the sixth loop is the one where you bring your soul's purpose to life. So if you'd like to close your eyes, you're welcome to. Unless you're driving a car, come back to it unless later. Unless you're driving a car. And I'm going to begin with that prayer of a strong container. And this isn't, yes, Janet wrote it, and yes, Janet received it, but this is a universal prayer. Blessed one, we are one. I am a strong container for the life that wants to be lived in and through and as me in 2017 and beyond. That life is your life, our life. And so I ask to be a strong container, and I can and I will 
And I am because we, we, we are the strong container for a whole and holy, thrilling life flowing in and through and as us. Bless our holy container. Now raise your hands above your head. About 15 inches above your head is your ninth chakra. Your ninth chakra holds your soul's purpose. Tap your ninth chakra three times, inviting your soul's purpose to be fully present in this meditation. Now tap the top of your head three times, honoring your connection with the divine and inviting divine presence to be fully with you in this meditation. Close your outer eyelids, unless, of course, you're driving, and tap your forehead, your third eye, awakening the eyes of your soul. Tap three times. Now imagine the lids of your outer ears closing and tap your temples three times, awakening the ears of your heart. And move your hands to your heart, your precious, holy, sacred heart. And we will tap the heart three times, each tap with a special phrase. I will say it the first time, and then repeat it with you. With the first tap, I ask to be a strong container for the living presence of the divine. Together, I ask to be a strong container for the living presence of the divine. The second tap, I am worthy to be a strong container for the living presence of the divine. Together, I am worthy to be a strong container for the living presence of the divine. Third tap, the truth, I am a strong container for the living presence of the divine. I am a strong container for the living presence of the divine. As you tap your heart, the round door opens and invites you to step in to the sacred spiral in your heart. In the silence, for a moment, Walk the sacred spiral, looking around, feeling, smelling, noticing. The spiral loves you being there, but knows that it is time to return. So in the silence, walk back up to the round open door in your heart. As you approach the round open door, step over the threshold, turn and blow a kiss, a little bow of gratitude and tell the sacred spiral, thank you, I will return. Then tap your heart three times, closing the round open door. 
Tap your temples three times, awakening your physical ears. Tap your third eye three times, awakening your physical eyes. Tap the top of your head three times in gratitude for your connection with the divine. And tap your soul's purpose in your ninth chakra over your head, thanking it whether you know what it is not, saying thank you, I love you, and I serve you, and all is well. Amen. Woohoo! <laughs> Just the tiniest, tiniest taste. Thank you so, so, so much, Janet. This has been an honor. This has been a treat. I can't thank you enough. i got to crank it back up for the finish here. <laughs> for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get find your soul's purpose, and begin living a life you love and shine bright. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you, Michael. You're shining. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>